pews. <laughs> That is a lesson. <laughs> I cannot state how passionately I hold to uh, what I just spoke to the children. Um, we are, uh, I, about three, four weeks ago, uh, I opened a series in the book of Acts. And the purpose of that, my primary objective, is that we as a church can become as effective as the early church was in winning their world. Um, we're going to read today, we won't, we won't get down to that scripture, but we're going to read where that they, at the end of a sermon, 3,000 people were converted. Now, and I want us to, uh, I want us to be effective. It seems like so much of what's going on in our world that the church is being more and more marginal less and less effective. And I think that it is that it's time for us to go back and take a look at the original plan. Uh, because we're going to find out that there's some things that take place and it's really not <coughs> It's really not inappropriate. And so we want to be effective and we're taking a look at, uh, at those things. Um, the the disciples were commanded to remain in Jerusalem until the promise of the Father came. And up to this point, up to this point, they had been unified. Uh, they were staying uh, in an upper room. Uh, Luke tells us they had spent a lot of time in prayer uh, and uh, together in the temple. Um, but we're coming here to the coming of the Holy Spirit and the day of Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit came, Pentecost not only changed them, it literally changed the world forever. It changed world history. And so, let's take a look at um, uh, oh, uh, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Uh, now, when the day of Pentecost came, they were together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Uh, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And of them, and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in a bewilderment because each one of them, each of them, each heard them speaking in their own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all of these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, <coughs> Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts of Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongue. Amazed and perplexed, they said, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they've had too much warmth. Well, we'll deal with that next week. But let's, uh, uh, let's talk about the text here just a little bit and see what we can learn and pull this apart because it, this becomes foundation to our effectiveness. First of all, the day of Pentecost. Uh, Pentecost, Penta, five. Pentecost 
is 50 days after the Sabbath of the Passover. Okay, that's, that's where the term comes from. Uh, and in Acts uh, 1-3, it said Jesus had appeared to the disciples 40 days, for a period of 40 days after the Passover. So what we're talking here is about 10 days after the ascension. Now, Pentecost is called by other names in Scripture. It's called the Feast of Weeks. It's also called the Feast of Harvest. Uh, it's also called the Day of First Fruits. All of those are the same uh, 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 festival that we're talking about. Now, what it is, it's the Jewish celebration of harvest home. Uh, it's their Thanksgiving, okay? That, that's, where, that's where they are. But and what's been interesting about this, now, you say, well, wow, Pentecost just happened just a few weeks ago. You have to understand, they are far, much farther south than we are. The wheat harvest takes place very early in the year. And so... Uh, by the time we're starting to plant, they're, they're harvesting their wheat. And so uh, that's, that's what's going on. Um, now, the, the, the highlight of Pentecost was they took the very first fruits of the wheat harvest and they made two loaves of bread and they presented it to the Lord. Now, up to, up to that time, they were allowed to eat the first fruits, they were allowed to do anything. This was to... Uh, this was to be an offering to God. Now, uh, the whole ceremony was actually a dedication of the harvest to God uh, as its giver. It was a big, like I say, it was a big Thanksgiving thing. And it was kind of a, kind of a neat way to do it, you know, uh, giving God things like that. And uh, uh, it was a dedication to Him. That's what's going on. Now, what's interesting about, again, a piece of trivia... Pentecost is the only one of the three great feasts which is not mentioned as a memorial to events in Jerusalem. Uh, uh, when you get to, um, I just said, um, grain harvest. What? Grain? No. <laughs> What's Easter go with? Thank you. I had the same thing happen to me in this study this morning. I had, <laughs> the Passover celebrates the uh, the passing over of Egypt, and and then of course you get uh, Yom Kippur, uh, which is the Day of Atonement. You know and everything, but that's that's where we, that's where we are. So uh, those those are kind of trivia, and yet I think if you think about the symbolism that that would bring, is that here is the time when we celebrate uh, oh, uh, the coming of the Lord and, and the, or the, the the coming of the harvest. Again, here we are empowered to begin to harvest the world. So I think it's I think that there's a there's an interesting connection that there that's there with us. Now, it says that they were all together in one place. Now this this is a little uh, uh, Luke when he writes is a little bit vague. Uh, but when we start talking about one place, it's probably not the upper room uh, where they were staying. I, I, I can say this because having been to Jerusalem now, wherever that upper room was, was totally destroyed in 70 AD. But in the rebuilding and stuff like that, I can tell you in the area where that was, the streets aren't even wide enough to drive a car down. So I don't know how you're going to get a crowd that size around an upper room. Okay, that, that's the first thing, just physically. But... Um, it's probably in the temple courts. Ray Vanderlaan makes the statement that the house, that they were, that the house were saying, often the temple was referred to as the house in a short, in a short form of house of God. Um, uh, but they were probably in the temple courts. Uh, you also find there that in Luke uh, 2453, it says, after Jesus ascended, which is this period of time, they stayed continually at the temple praising God. 
So I think it's a pretty good bet that they're at the temple. And when you begin to think about that, that's a really likely explanation why, first of all, you would have a big place. You have 3,000 people getting saved. Um, you couldn't get 3,000 people in here. You know, <laughs> you couldn't get 300 people in here. You know, it's, it's, it's that. It's, it's got to be a big place. And um, there's a large crowd, but also uh, it's diverse. And so where would you have a large, diverse crowd on a day like this? And the answer is with the temple. They're getting ready for a, uh, a ceremony that, that they're doing. So uh, chances are they are in the temple. Um, then what happens is, is a sound like a violent wind. Now, when we start talking about the spirit, both in Greek and Hebrew, um, Greek pneuma, Hebrew rahuk, uh, don't you love that name? Rahuk. Um, the word spirit also means wind. And you have to watch the context to understand how to uh, 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 translate it. But, this, but, but it is the same term. So when you get the sound of a rushing mighty wind, uh, it would uh, kind of complete the, uh, the matter. Also, uh, in John chapter 3, verses 8, Jesus is talking about the Spirit, and he says, The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So is everyone born of the Spirit. The Spirit is like the wind. And so when, when the Holy Spirit comes, you get this initial sound that sounds like wind from heaven. Okay? Um, then, what happened to my top phone? Got mixed up. Then, it says what happened is that there seemed to be tongues of fire that came to set on their heads. Now, uh, this again um, talks about uh, some prophecies about what the Spirit would be like. Uh, in John, uh, in Luke 3.16, John answered and said to them all, I baptize you with water, but the one who is more powerful than I will come, uh, uh, will come, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So what we're, what we're finding here is, is a consistent uh, uh, fulfillment of uh, what Jesus had told them and, and what was happening there. Now, fire in and of itself is, first of all, fire is a symbol of zeal. <clears throat> Man, he's on fire! You know? Okay. Uh, is a symbol of zeal. And so when we start getting baptized with the Spirit, uh, we find that there is a new zeal. Uh, for the work of God. Furthermore, uh, fire is cleansing. Uh, scripture teaches us that our God is a cleansing fire. And so what happens when uh, we begin to see the coming of the Holy Spirit, one of the, one of the things that happens when we come to the, when the Holy Spirit does come, one of maybe three functions is cleansing. And we find ourselves uh, being transformed. Uh, one of the things that I would like to say just as an aside here, too often people want to make this a one-time experience. But scripture makes it very clear that we are to be continually filled with the Spirit. That we are, that, that, that we are going to have experiences from time to time that, that transform us throughout our Christian life. And... Um, uh, why do you say that, Pastor John? Because I was raised in a uh, holiness church that taught the second definite work, and the idea was, well, you got dunked once and that was enough. But I was around those people long enough to know that some of them needed another dip. <laughs> the... Uh, uh, but and if, if we if we if you study scripture carefully, you will find you will find 
that this is to be a, an ongoing experience. But in the initial experience, we have the idea of zeal, uh, and we have the idea of cleansing going along with it. Um, it says, they spoke with other tongues. Uh, I'm not, we're not going to deal with controversy or whatever here. We're going to look at the scripture and just take what it says. First of all, the Spirit enabled them. This is something that was miraculous. This wasn't something that uh, was learned or over a period of time or anything at all like that. The Spirit enabled them to do this. Um, in fact, they said, aren't these guys all Galileans? Now, what you have to understand about that, what we don't get, um, that's like saying, didn't all these guys come from the south, y'all? You know, that's what they're saying. Galileans were considered uneducated, uncouth, and they really didn't uh, have the, they, they didn't speak the king's <coughs> English, if you will. Say, aren't these guys all, aren't these guys all Galileans? And yet we hear. Okay? And so it, the gift of the Spirit was enabled by the Spirit. And the next thing we find, and what's mentioned here is, is 13 different languages that people hear him. Now, if you'll trace those out, and I just want to put this up so that you get a, just a visual of how far away and how distributed that those, uh, those people were from, when you begin to look at that, you begin to see that what you're dealing with here is a statement of basically the then known world. You see how, how uh, how far we are and whatever. And so when we begin talking about that and those, um, those 13 languages, we can begin to see that we have taken on something new. Now, why is this significant? Jesus, when he was here and did his ministry, his ministry was basically confined to Israel. If you remember, he's entire, and the Syrophoenician woman comes to him and says, will you come and heal my daughter? And he says, listen, I, I'm just sent to the lost sheep of Israel, and I'm not supposed to take the bread of the children and give it to the dogs. Remember that? And she says to him with great faith, she said, yes, but the dogs get to eat the crumbs from the master's table. And he, But you have to understand, Jesus' ministry was confined. When he sent the... Uh, the disciples out on their preaching missions. They sent them out two by two when he sent the 70 out. They were told to stay to Israel and stay there. That's the significance of Matthew uh, 28 and the Great Commission when he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Therefore, you go into all the world and preach the gospel. See, this is, a, this is a huge change. And so what's happening here, as the Holy Spirit comes, we've got the whole world here uh, uh, around and are hearing in their own native tongue. It says that uh, they all heard in their native tongue. Now, let's pick up the significance on that. It's easy to read through them. Anybody here fluently speak another language. I do. I can speak English in Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> I lived in southern I, I lived in uh, I lived in southern Indiana for about 12, 13 years. And I can say things like Son <laughs> and y'all. Y'all. And uh, yeah. And uh, you put your groceries in poke. <laughs> That's a joke. No, but when we start talking about our native language, uh, I don't know if any of you have actually taken foreign languages. Uh, but here's the problem. Uh, well, I can tell you, even in my own family, my son-in-law comes from Nigeria. And uh, he is very fluent in, in uh, English. In fact, uh, didn't he do 4-0 in his master's work and stuff like that? I mean, he, he, he's very, very smart. But, he's, but his native language is Nigerian. And so there are times when we have to stop and explain an English idiom or something like that. 
okay, what he understands best and misunderstands least is his native tongue, right? Okay, now, what we've got here is not a matter of intelligence, it's a matter of what we grew up with. And so what we find here is, to avoid any misunderstandings, to avoid any uh, non-understanding, when the Holy Spirit comes to these people and they begin to speak, they hear in their own native language. Well, that sounds like the communication was critical. Right? Sounds like the communication with That the message was more important than the medium. Okay? So they heard in their native tongues. What they heard was that these Galileans, who were basically uneducated and whatever, these Galileans were talking about the wonders of God. That's what they spoke. Now, Having, having said that, then we find that the purpose of the diverse languages was so that those present could understand. And we have to keep that in mind. The core of everything here is so that those present could understand the message. That was the purpose of, uh, of the different languages. All right. Um, let's apply this. Let's talk about what we got. Well, we're, and, and again, we're, what we're talking about here now, why did we go through this? We went through this because we want to be effective. We want to see the day when there are uh, lots of people brought to Christ here in our community, right? Isn't this where Christ left us? Isn't this our mission field? Now, I can tell you, if we're going to be effective in foreign missions, the light that shines farthest shines brightest at home. And so we can give money to foreign missions, but if we are going to be effective in getting out to the foreign missions, we have to be doing our missionary work here. Uh, and and that's, that's, what, that's what we're doing. So, prior to the coming of the Holy Spirit, there is a period of rumination. There is a period of prayer. There is a period of unification. There's, there's, there's a period of preparation of the hearts of the people of God. And they spent 10 days praising God in the temple, praying continually, in agreement with what was going on. Okay? And so what we have here is, is that preparation is time of unity and prayer. Uh, I forget who said it, but they said when God wants to do a work among His people, He sets them praying. And so prayer becomes foundational to any evangelistic work we may choose to do. And so prior to that, there is a time of preparation and we should expect <coughs> preparation. Too often we get too impatient. Oh, I want to see, you know, millions are dying, we've got to go, we've got to do it now. Well, yeah, I thought Billy Graham said it best. He was in, he was talking to some young uh, seminarians, and I can tell you in seminary, uh, people with a fresh call on their life just want to get out, spread the word. And Billy Graham was addressing them, and he said, I know how you feel, but, but, stay in school said, you know, a woodsman is not known for his swing. He's known by the sharpness of his axe. Stay in school, sharpen your axe, and then go. You'll cut down a whole lot more trees with a whole lot effort. Okay? So, I would suggest to us as a congregation that we make a time in our own mind, in our own heart, 
I would suggest, and I, I'm going to make this a suggestion, I'm not going to make it a commitment, but as a suggestion, I would suggest that all of us take some time between 6 in the morning and 10 in the morning. I think I got when all of you get up. <laughs> I don't know. I guess maybe some of us get up at the crack at noon. But, uh, yeah. but sometime, sometime in that 6 to 10 period, that we simply begin to pray. And our prayer should consist probably of just a couple of things. things. Father, help us to be effective in winning souls on our mission field. Father, help us to stay uh, unified and love one another. And Father, fill us with your spirit so that we may be effective. Yes. That's not weeping and wailing before the Lord for for four hours a day. That's a five minute at the most prayer. A 30 second prayer. But if we keep praying that day in and day out and all of us begin working with that, we're going to begin to see things begin to move. And so, a time of unity and prayer. Now, while they uh, were effective in the past, this is going to take them to a whole new level of ministry. I want you to think about something. Jesus, after, in the training of the twelve, after they had uh, observed uh, him do ministry, and that he observed them doing ministry, he sent them out two by two on a preaching mission, mission to the various villages. And it says, and they came back, and they said, Lord, even the demons are, are subject to us. And they were excited. Uh, about the healings that were done and the effectiveness of what was going on. So it wasn't that these people were strangers to effective ministry. What the coming of the Holy Spirit and the individual filling does is going to take their ministry to a whole new level. First of all, it goes from their little uh, Jewish nation to the whole world. Second of all, it's going to take them out in areas of effectiveness that are going to shake the whole world. They are, uh, and they are going to be doing different things. And it's just a whole major level of ministry. And so what we need to expect is, is when the Holy Spirit does come, ministry is going to increase. And there's going to be a, a much larger expectation. Finally, what we need is for the Spirit to be able to enable us to speak the wonders of God in a manner that all can understand. This, have, this speaks particularly to me because I, I, from time to time, will have people say to me, um, you use a lot of big words. <laughs> And I do. Um, the problem is that that's my background. And I, I use words for certain things. Now, I do my best when I understand it to explain it. But what we need to understand is, is that while that's been my gift, uh, uh, actually it comes from my, my education is what happens, while that is God's gift to me, I have to be able to take the language and put the cookie, take the cookies down and put them on the bottom shelf. So that regardless of what a person's educational or understanding background is, they know exactly what I'm saying. Amen. Okay? And I, I, I honestly work hard at that. And so we, as a people, notice we talked about how we're supposed to be witnesses. Well, this is what the witness is all about. The wonderful works of God, but said in a way that the people that we come into contact with, the people that we come into contact with, understand the wonderful works of God. Amen? Amen. 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 Interesting lesson, isn't it? Interesting, interesting lesson. Let us pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, as we come before your throne, we thank you for what you've done for us. And, Father, while maybe what we're speaking is not uh, 
emotionally charged, Father it certainly is speaking to us. Lord, we as a congregation want to be effective. Lord, we want to get the job done that you sent us to do. And we'll just admit we're ignorant. We don't know how. Father, I know we all have tried things in the past that have worked. But what we're looking for now is for us to follow a pattern and to find what you would have us and how you would empower us. Lord, we are asking as we wait here as a congregation in unity, we ask, Father, will you please uh, send your power to us? Won't you please keep us unified? Lord, won't you please make us effective in this community, and we'll thank you for it.